Almost everybody I know hated reading the Iliad. I didn't, and I think that's because I knew a lot of the backstory, which I'm going to share with you today. First of all, you should read the Iliad. It's a beautiful piece of literature that has plenty to say about timeless themes we can all relate to, like war, peace, life, love, death, humanity, etc. Looking at the similarities and differences between the ancient Greeks' perspectives on these themes thousands of years ago and ours today can be very fascinating. Most of the epic poems that the Greeks read and listened to have been lost to time. All we have today are the Iliad and the Odyssey in full. Besides them, we have tiny fragments of the other poems, and also lots of references to events that occurred within them in later books. And just from that, we get a ton of the backstory that happened right before the Iliad. This is backstory that the ancient Greeks would have known and brought to the Iliad when they heard it, and it would have made it more meaningful for them because they understood more of what was going on. And I think we can do that too. The Greeks believed in many gods. Each one had control over a different aspect of nature or society. There was a god of the oceans, of the sky, marriage, war, specific cities on the map. In the time before humanity, there were gods called Titans. Kronos was the king of the Titans, and he was the god of time. He was afraid of being overthrown, so he began to eat his children to prevent them from ever rising up against him. One of his children, named Zeus, escaped and returned later to fight, defeat, and imprison him, rescuing his siblings from his belly. Zeus then deposed all of the rest of the Titans as well. He and his siblings and children became the new gods in power. Prometheus, one of these Titans, makes a prophecy that Zeus, too, will someday be overthrown by his own offspring. In Greek mythology, prophecies are always taken very seriously, and are expected to happen at some point. Zeus almost gets overthrown by his siblings, but then gets rescued by Thetis, one of the sea nymphs. He owes her a great debt and wants to marry her, but then decides against it after hearing a prophecy about Thetis. This prophecy stated that whoever fathered her son would be surpassed in power by that son. Remembering both this prophecy and the one that Prometheus had made about him, Zeus takes immediate action to make sure that Thetis and her son do not become threats to him. First, Zeus refuses to marry Thetis and marries Hera, the goddess of marriage, instead. Zeus goes one step further, though, because any immortal child of Thetis could be a threat at some point. Her husband has to be human. The gods together agree that Peleus, a Greek hero and king, should be the one chosen. He was a great hero and had accomplished a lot, but he could only ever have mortal children. The marriage is arranged, and Zeus invites almost all of the gods and goddesses to the wedding feast. He decides not to invite Eris, the goddess of discord, because she's known for causing, well... Discord. Eris is insulted by this and decides to try to spoil the party anyway. Might have been something like a self-fulfilling prophecy. She throws a golden apple into the wedding feast that has inscribed on it the words, For the Fairest. As soon as the apple is discovered, all of the goddesses start arguing amongst themselves to decide which one of them should have the apple, or really, which one of them is the most beautiful. It gets narrowed down to Athena, the goddess of battle strategy, Hera, Zeus's wife and the goddess of marriage, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love. They ask Zeus to pick between him, but he refuses to, because he doesn't want to get into trouble, and he wants to keep peace among the gods. So he tells them to go and ask Paris, a human, instead. Paris is one of the princes of Troy. The three goddesses go to see him, agreeing to honor his choice, whatever it may be, but they each decide to bribe him first, to win him over to their side. Hera offers to make him the king of Europe and Asia, Athena offers him a glorious victory in battle, and Aphrodite offers him Helen, the most beautiful woman in the world. So instead of picking between them based on their beauty, Paris really just decided which offer he liked the best. Paris chose to give the apple to Aphrodite because he appreciated her offer the most. In doing so, he earned Aphrodite's friendship for him and his family, but earned the wrath of Hera and Athena. Paris discovers, after he makes his choice, that Helen is already married to King Menelaus of Argos in Greece. This does not deter Paris, so he decides to sail to Argos, pretending to be on a diplomatic mission. Paris then seduces and or kidnaps Helen, with Aphrodite's help, while Menelaus is away. Whether Helen goes with him freely or not is uncertain, partly due to variance in the sources, but partly due to Aphrodite's influence. The Greek gods and goddesses can influence the mortals' wills. They can make them feel certain emotions at certain times that are convenient to them. They can control what they think about, what they pay attention to, and they can even 
pretend to be a trusted friend or comrade that tells them to do something. One way or another, Paris brings Helen with him back to Troy, which is ruled by his father, King Priam. When Menelaus discovers what has happened, he contacts his brother, King Agamemnon. The two brothers together assemble an army of soldiers, heroes, and kings from all over Greece with the intention to sail to Troy and win Helen back. While all of this was going on, Peleus and Thetis had a son named Achilles. In addition to the earlier prophecy concerning Thetis' son, there was a prophecy about Achilles himself as well. Achilles was fated to either die in battle at a young age, but win undying glory and remembrance, or to live a long, peaceful life as king of his father's lands, but without any glory or remembrance after his death. Thetis feared the worst for her son, and tried to make him invulnerable by dipping him into the river Styx. However, she held him by his heel, leaving him vulnerable in that spot alone. As prophesied, Achilles becomes one of the greatest warriors that ever lived, even by the age of 16. He is aware of the prophecy concerning his death, and so tries to hide when Agamemnon's recruiters come looking for him. He is tricked into giving himself away, however, and at that point resigns himself to his fate. He goes with Agamemnon and Menelaus to Troy, bringing an army of his countrymen with him. Meanwhile, the Trojans gather their own armies to defend themselves and call for allies to come from far inland. The Greeks and the Trojans each have a number of gods supporting their side as well. The Greeks finally arrive at Troy and battle the Trojans for nearly ten years. The Iliad begins during the tenth and final year of this war and follows the story of Achilles. That's about all you need to know to get started reading the book. Join me in the next video and we'll pick apart chapter one.